Hello, everybody. Hi there. I am Lise Benenson. I'm a vice president at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law. Yay. <laughs> um, it's a nice, it was a very nice bit. Um, thank you all again for being here today, and thank you to all of you who will be listening in later. Um, it has been, I think, for all of us, humbling to watch the, walk these streets uh, in this birthplace of democracy, thinking of the citizens gathering in the Agora to learn the news and debate the important issues of the day, and come to consensus. Consensus, of course, is something in our country that we are struggling with, shall we say. Um, on an array of critical issues, climate change, gun violence, healthcare, immigration, our people are divided and our politicians are seemingly incapable of finding a way forward. So how do these issues play out in the presidential election and where does one side or the other benefit in this? So I want to start taking a quick look at 2018 midterms where we saw historically high turnout, um, 20 million fewer voters than we had for the presidential election in 2016. In those midterms, voters said health care was their most important issue, followed by immigration and the economy. Democrats, of course, won a massive victory, taking back the House. Is this election in 2020 going to be about those issues, or is there something else driving this fight? And Betsy, let's start with you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I do think that in uh, 2020, I think... And in, in, in the polls that we've done by Benenson Strategy Group, uh, of the 2018 uh, voters did, you know, you're right, healthcare was right up there. I have, I think that the Trump issue plays even larger, though, now uh, in 2020, whereas not as many people, I was surprised looking at the polls in 2018 that there certainly was a, a high degree of people that cited Trump as a motivator for their vote, for their vote but they were much more issue oriented than I had thought that they would be. Whereas I think now, um, in 2020, we've just kind of come to this uh, Trump factor is kind of looming over uh, so much of the discussion that um, I think that that's going to play out as really one of the major issues. And then, you know, looking at, you know, the spectrum uh, in the Democratic Party of, of their ideology, and we see that playing out now in the primaries of, of going more toward the Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders side of the party or going more toward like the Biden Klobuchar uh, side of the party. And so I think a lot of that will be played out in the primary, which will leave us uh, for a general election that will be very kind of Trump focused. Jonathan, same question. Both two Jonathans, <laughs> two Martins, two Jonathans. I couldn't say it better than my lovely wife. Um, who, yeah, exactly. It's king of Rome there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is going to be, I think, to a large degree, a referendum on a president who's unique in American history. And I don't think, I don't see how we get around that. Look, will the Republicans and the White House try to sort of elevate issues, the Green New Deal, you know, tax exempt churches, uh, you know, whatever else sort of culture war fodder that they can find? Of course they will. Um, but I don't, I don't see how you get around this being a referendum on the constant ubiquitous uh, figure in all of our lives that we all sort of sleep with and wake up with every day. Um, and I just think that that's going to be the, that's going to be the sort of driving force of, of 2020. And he wouldn't have it in any other way, by right. the way. I mean, <laughs> his, his people will say to him, no, you know, it's important we make this about the, the Democrats and, and they want to ban hamburgers. And he'll do that, and he'll try that, but it's always going to come back to him because he wants it to be about him. Right. Um, or plastic straws. Or yeah, well, like, <laughs> like whatever culture war stuff they can yeah. find, but he wants to make it about about him. Um, I mean, you just look at what happened yesterday where they capture Baghdadi, and you know they released that picture of, of him because they want to have his version of the Obama um, – Picture after yeah. Captain Bin Laden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he, he can't help but compare the cap to the killing of Baghdad, the, the killing of Bin Laden, because it's just it's about him. And I, so it'll be a fascinating push and pull in his own campaign between wanting to make this about the radical socialist hamburger banning Democrats in um, Trump, which is like what Democrats want it to be about, and what Trump wants it to be about. 
Well, sort of to that end, we spent, uh, we, we've spent every Democratic debate so far with a, a really powerful focus on health care. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, I'm curious, uh, what, do you, what do you think of that as a strategy? How does that play out for us? And, and are Democrats going to have to, what, what's that going to look like for them? Well, I think the health care remains, regardless of what voters tell us, and as Betsy said, we saw a lot of this in 2018 in the uh, exit polls and um, uh, other polling throughout the campaign that voters were saying health care was very important. And we should also note that the Democrats, something like 50 or 60 percent of their ads focused on health care in 2018. The stats are pretty staggering. Um, but I think that health care is um, more of a litmus test for a broader set of where you are on this uh, you know, uh, progressive to moderate spectrum in the Democratic primary. And you're seeing that with debates over Medicare for all or a public option or all this other, all these other sort of ancillary issues that come up around um, health care. Um, and I think why people say that health care is such an important issue to them is that so many Americans, and that includes uh, very comfortable Americans, experience severe financial hardship. Um, because they're paying for health care costs, or they are navigating a very difficult health care system. So a candidate who can really speak to that reality, which is true, you know, not just for, in, in many ways, it's actually more true for middle and upper middle class voters than it is for very poor voters who are on Medicaid and actually have essentially a universal health care system. Um, that is going to be a very helpful uh, way, not just only to speak to that specific issue, but to talk about the extent to which you can think about the kitchen table issues of uh, generally of voters. So Jonathan Capehart, um, what do you, if, if, if we need to talk about Trump, if Trump wants us to talk about Trump, um, is that just something we're going to have to wait to have a candidate to have happen? Because Democrats aren't really talking about Trump when, when they're out there right now. How are they, or are, do you think they're talking about him enough? <laughs> well, um, I think on the campaign trail, they're talking about real issues because they're talking to real people who aren't focused on the president the way we are focused on the president. Um, I do think that the Democratic candidates have all in their own way been talking, and I think this is the right thing, talking about the issues, but also whether they mention his name or not, talking about the president. So I wrote down three things, and I think uh, we all mentioned them, gun control, immigration, and health care. So on health care, the president's still trying to do away with Obamacare. Meanwhile, there are millions of people around the country who depend on it. And so to, to Pat's point, I mean, health care is a very emotional issue. And so now you have the, the Democrats can focus on the president's attempts to take away people's health care. Uh, gun control. We watched the president um, in that epic meeting with seated next to Senator Dianne Feinstein, where he said to the Republicans around the table, you guys are afraid of the NRA. That's why you won't do anything. And I think we should have background checks. Of course, he reversed course, not once, not twice, but I think three times on doing anything about background checks or anything regular. Uh, doing something about gun violence, but that's another emotional issue. How many more mass shootings can happen in the United States affecting all sorts of communities and not have it impact the campaign? And then another time when the president on national television, uh, this time with immigration early on in his term when he said, I want a quote, bill of love to deal with the dreamers issue, to deal with DACA, and yet nothing has happened. Instead, what he's done is um, race bait immigrants. And the last two weeks of the, the 2018 midterm campaign was a two week, every day, multiple rallies um, that touched on, very, on racist, xenophobic themes. And while Democrats won back the House, his strategy focused solely on red states. He not only kept the Senate in the Republican column, but won two seats. And so I think Democrats have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, have to be able to talk about the issues, which I think they're doing, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joel, and everyone else who's paying attention, Michael, uh, but they also have to talk about how they're going to achieve the goals they want to achieve in all of these issues in ways that the president actually hasn't. So 
I am concerned in this election that, that we are experiencing something that we didn't the last time around, which is that we have now been living through this dramatic breakdown of democratic norms um, for three years. So lies are truth, science is fake news, allies are enemies. It is this bewildering political moment. And I'm curious about, at this point, are democratic candidates breaking through um, enough? And, and I'm curious from each of you, how, what should they, is there something else they should be doing uh, to let voters know who they are, to help voters get enough information to be able to make the choices they're gonna need to make over the next six months? Well, I mean, I think they're breaking through to the extent that they can in this environment, um, given the president's capability of driving the news cycles. But I have to say, I've been a little surprised at the lack of creativity among some of the Democratic candidates for president. I thought that the sheer number of them would foster more ingenuity and creativity in terms of their tactics and some of their... But you just don't see it. Like, I mean, I, mean, I would have thought, for example that one of these candidates would show up at the Trump Hotel and have a press conference about, you know, the president, first of all, having a business as president, but then second of all, you know, these countries that come to D.C. and get a block of rooms there for his, his hotel, and I'm like, you know, where is that press conference outside or inside the Trump Hotel? I mean, like that kind of thing. I just don't see, like, if you're Steve Bullock or like Michael Bennett, and you're desperate to get attention, um, you know. Like, well, <clears throat> well, yeah, and, but there's yeah, a way that you can do launched, it. Gillibrand launched her campaign on the street in front of the Trump Hotel, and but that was obscured by some big news event that Sunday. What was that? There's some other news that, that, that happened. There's but they're also, I mean, they're also, the whole, the impeachment looming over, I think, is still within the party. Like, how far did they go on that? And I think you have the candidates um, maybe more concerned that they don't want to be pushing that as much. Um, and so you don't see it quite as prevalent. Well, they also, I think they're, they're, they're as one campaign told me, they said, look, you know, we don't really want to weigh in on the, ideolo the ideological food fight, but that's yeah. what you guys are covering yeah. because you guys are covering the tension points in the Democratic primary because that's what you do. But if we don't weigh in on that, we're not going to get covered in the main of the of the coverage. Mm -hmm. So just whacking Trump is not enough for you guys to cover us. We have to sort of weigh in on whose side are we on in, terms of, in this primary debate. So I think it's it's been um, it's been challenging for some of these candidates um, if they don't want to play on the turf of you know, center versus left in the primary. I, I think one thing to keep in mind is, you know, Trump is currently running about 20 percentage points lower than where his approval rating should be given the state of the economy. Mm -hmm. So this is a guy who, as much as people kind of think of him as a Teflon president, is actually severely taxed by his behavior. Oh, totally. And so the, yeah. the way to think about the general election is if Trump were the ideal candidate, he would run only on the basis of the economy. Mm -hmm. He would play down all the culture war stuff and just say, look, record low unemployment, including for Latinos and African Americans, which, you know, he says, I don't know, but he doesn't want every to. thousandth tweet or something. But the, um, you know, the Democrat is going to make going to want to make this all about Trump, uh, because, you know, if you don't make it about Trump, then Trump can say, are you better off than you were four years ago? The answer is yes. Yeah. I, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I know we're going to talk more about women uh, in politics tomorrow, but I think it's interesting on that notion of the economy, men are getting are giving him credit for it. It's the women that are not getting giving him credit yeah. for it. And so, I mean, there are a couple of questions on why that could be. Is it because women aren't feeling the economic prosperity as much? We know we women make less than men, but they're they I, I think the whole negativity about Trump, um, women that clouds that lens so much more yeah. that they're not they are not going to give him an inch on it. Right. But men are willing to do it. I, I think the, the Democratic PTSD from 2016 is so intense yeah. that yeah. a lot of people in the party overestimate his strength. He's the most unpopular modern president in American history. He never gets above 43% in any credible poll. He, his head-to-head -head numbers against all the Democratic candidates in crucial states are not good for him. Uh, he rarely gets above 41, 42. Um, he's doing nothing to change his... His position. He's not running on the economy. He wants to run on, on grievance and identity. Um, unlike every other president who tries to expand their base going into their re-election, 
he's basically just sort of reaffirming his base. Um, so he, he's not taking steps to like improve his standing, which is dismal. And so, like, if I, I think it's really puzzling. I don't understand it at all. Yes, Democrats have taken stances in the primary that could make it easier for him to, to win re-election next year. But this is a very beleaguered president going into his re-election. And I think that, that that's somehow lost. That, like, he's a very weakened president, given what's happened in the last three years. And I think that that's sort of missed because there's this... Um, this fatalism that has just always been been around with Democrats that is now taken to the new levels. We're gonna we're gonna blow this thing, you know. Um, and you always heard that from Democrats, but God, it's so intense now, you know. <laughs> Every year is more intense than before. Yeah. But here's the reason why, even though he's beleaguered, I am he's gonna be impeached. Well, I mean, he's beleaguered, and he he might be he will be impeached. Whether he's removed from office is a whole other conversation. Right. But the reason why I say to my Democratic friends that even though he's weak and beleaguered and way down in the polls, he could still win. And it's a very real possibility. One, because of the example I used of the 2018 midterm elections where he focused his efforts on red, on red state seats. But also in 2016, I think it was to Michael's point about um, the Republican Party and the Trump campaign's machine, I called what they did in 2016 fracking for votes. They pulled out extra votes, well, extra, votes that hadn't come out before. And so they did it in 16 with people who like, hovered below the radar. Mm -hmm. And I am th I am 100% convinced that there are even more people hovering below the radar who could be fracked in that way, mm -hmm. get their votes out. And that's why, even though Dem Democrats do the... No. <laughs> it was on. It was on. Yeah, yeah it was it's on. on. Even though, even though Democrats every four years have this hand wringing, bed wetting. Oh my God, we don't have a candidate. We're going to blow this thing. Um, there is, there is, I think, um, something beneficial to not underestimating President Trump and his ability to pull out votes that um, wouldn't come out otherwise. And my hope is that. Democrats are operating in a same in a similar manner because on the Democratic side there are votes out there that have never come out to vote and I hope Democrats uh, the Democrat when I say Democrats the party and other organizations may ensure that those votes come to the polls because I I thoroughly believe if Democrats come out and vote in November 2020 and vote for the Democratic nominee the Democratic nominee will become the next president of the United States so let me ask you a question, though. Is that a get-out-the-vote process? Is that a tech process? Or is that an issue process? What is it going to take to frack those votes? What do you what do you see as needed to frack those votes this time around? Nominate Donald Trump. Say that again? Nominate Donald Trump. Oh, he is the nominee. That's the motivator right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a big, a big question, I mean, where you saw the biggest gains in 2018 was among young voters in terms of turnout, right? Yeah. So... It is interesting when you think about who are the Democratic candidates who are most appealing to young voters. We're back at Bernie, maybe a little Andrew Yang among the guys I call the gamer bro yeah. kind of vote. Um, but the, um, you know, you're not actually seeing a lot of candidates who are getting young voters that excited uh, among on the Democratic side, except for, I would say, except for Bernie. Yeah, that excitement factor, mm -hmm. I think, will play. I, I think Trump is the turnout lever for yeah. Democrats. Yeah. He was the, yeah. the turnout lever in 2017 in Virginia, uh, in right. New Jersey. He was the Alabama. turnout lever in the 2018 midterms. Certainly helped in Alabama, along with the Republicans nominating a guy who was banned from a mall because he was he was trolling uh, girls, um, which, isn't, it, which isn't typically helpful um, for candidates' prospects to win a statewide election, in my experience. Um, <laughs> So, like, I just think Trump is the Trump is the turnout lever, and um, uh, if you look at what happened in the midterms, where Democrats won, um, you know, she had a terrible pollster, but Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan, for example, uh, overcame <laughs> uh, overcame her really mediocre polling, frankly, um, basically like operating in the dark there, uh, and. Uh, she somehow, no, but, but seriously, Whitmer wins in Michigan by a pretty healthy margin. Tony Evers wins in Wisconsin by a very narrow margin. 
Um, and it, that those two races told me a lot about what was happening. Um, I think in the places where, where Democrats need to win. Um, and I, tell me a, a state that Trump's going to win this time that he didn't win last time. They want to get Minnesota in the column, but his numbers in Minnesota are terrible. I mean, the Star Tribune had a poll two weeks ago that came out that had Trump head to head against every Democrat. I don't think he was higher than forty one or forty two there. So I don't know where they where he gets a new state, and he won Michigan and Wisconsin by you know a few thousand votes. And he had Gary Johnson, Joel Stein on the ballot. I just, I'm just not sure where it gets better for him. I guess that's what I'm saying. Now that said, caveat being, Democrats have their own issues, and obviously. Democrats could give him fodder um, by, by going to the left. But I, I, I'm just not sure if you look at the map today, a new state that he gets, and I think it, it's difficult to think that he could hold all the states he got last time. John, did you want to jump in on this one? Oh, no, I agree with Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> the Go ahead, are, Kiki. Are He's good. got a question. He is so weak at this point. Yeah. Why are Republican office holders still working out? Their, their primary deadlines haven't yeah. come yet? Right. Primary deadlines? Yeah, they're terrified of their own voters. File, I mean, yeah. f- file and deadlines. I am so fascinated to see how their behavior changes next year yeah. after the filing deadlines come and go for their primaries. primaries. That, I mean, that, that's going to be a really fascinating story. Who files against them? And if they, if they don't have folks file against them in the primaries, I think you'll see more of them liberated. Um, when, did the first pri- when did the first deadlines hit? Next year, oh, those it's who are watching. it's early. It's early because the March prime, the Texas primary is in March. Okay. So, like Texas, for example, I think it's like in December or January. Yeah, so it's pretty early. So I think that would be. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That'll be very revealing. No, I mean you know McConnell and Graham are, are both up next year. I, they're they're cognizant of their voters and their voters, at least the hardcore, is still with Trump. I mean, the country's polarized and. The, the 35 percent that's hardcore for Trump, you know, that they can't anger. Cory Gardner had a fascinating observation on this. You know, he endorsed Trump early this time after holding out last time, and I talked to him about it. And you know, basically he said, "Look, it's easier for me to do this now than just hold out and get question after question mm-hmm. about this, um, and keep it a, an open matter because every you know Lincoln Day dinner that I would go to." If you hadn't endorsed Trump, that elephant's in the room there, right? And if you're an incumbent Republican senator, I mean, a lot of your schedule back home is like, you know, county GOP events. It's sort of hard to go to those events. It's hard to see activists when you haven't endorsed the sitting president for re-election. It just, it creates real challenges. Rob knows this. He was the head of the NRSC. I mean, that's a tough place to be, which is why the Collins deal to me is still extraordinary that she hasn't endorsed Trump yet. It also helps that she hasn't said that she's running for re-election yet either. Um, but that's going to be awkward at some point when she goes home mm-hmm. and she is running and she hasn't endorsed the, the sitting president because you're squeezed between his, his diehards and obviously the, the broader electorate. But no, that's so we are clearly up here. Everyone is in violent agreement that um, this, this election is about Trump and more Trump. Um, you know, one of the questions I think uh, those of us who work in think tank universe is: When are you going to talk about our issues? Are you ever going to talk mm-hmm. about our issues? Is there anything? In, you know, that we're not talking about in the news every day, that you think could wind up playing a bigger role in this election than we think at this moment? Hmm. Outside of Trump. Or is it just still Trump? It's hard to see what that is now. I mean, yeah, does something come up, you know? Yeah, do we have an event. You know, the one million school shooting again coming? I mean, you know, unseen, unforeseen events that always happen in politics but nothing could be looking looming. Looking right uh, a third party candidate, candidate. on the ballot um, taking votes from one side or the other. Yeah. Some kind of a national security event, either home, <clears throat> home or abroad. Um, the intervention of Russia or some other kind of foreign actor in the election, obviously. Is, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Does the, does the uh-huh. nature of, of the race change at all? Um, and how does it change? When, if and when Trump is actually impeached, whether or not he leaks off, let's presume he's still yeah. in office, but he's been impeached? Um, or is that just, that's just more fodder for the same fire? I think it's more fodder for the same, for the same fire. Mm-hmm. I think it gets, it, it gets more intense, more interesting, and I think more unpredictable if, 
the trial goes to the Senate. Yeah. And what McConnell does with that, whether he actually allows there to be a full on trial, and then how does how does the how do the dynamics change once there's more evidence? And what did the Republican senators do? I'm not going to out this person who I was talking to, but this person said to me, they're not sure whether it is a foregone conclusion that the Senate would not convict President Trump. But if we got if we got to that point, that could change the dynamic. Well, and and sure. and, or new facts, and, you know. and the yeah. evidence, yeah, the, facts. the evidence that's going to be brought forth, I think, could be you know significant. Have a significant what does John Bolton that, say yeah. in open testimony? Yeah. if he's up on the hill testifying, right? About, you know, a lot of this testimony that's going on right now is sort of behind closed doors. Once we sort of see what what these folks are saying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've got the anonymous book now, again, coming out. Um, yeah. I mean, that there, certainly was a big story when the op-ed came out, mm-hmm. so I assume there was more there, too. Are there new facts that come yeah. out in the impeachment inquiry? Yeah. So it starts to sound like the, it's, the, it's the Nancy Pelosi strategy of running yeah. the president. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it, it is her, her timing. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's, let's switch this a little, because they're really, I mean, when we were going to talk about issues here, there is only one issue. Um, how do you how do you think Pelosi's pacing mm-hmm. has been on this? Um, are are, you, are there things that she should be looking out for as she goes forward with this and thinking about how we support how she supports the party? I'm going to quote um, a great former chairman of a political party, <laughs> um, Republican <laughs> National <laughs> Committee yeah. Chairman Michael Steele, who said on my on my podcast. Basically, the message was Democrats, quote, trust Nancy. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and that's that has always been my rule of thumb since she was minority leader. Well, actually, since she was speaker the first go around and got the Affordable Care Act with no Republican votes. Um, and when the Democrats retook the House in in 2018 and people were carping, about, oh, my God, we need to change the leadership. We need fresh blood. Right. And the president goes out there the day after the election and gives a press conference that sort of proves to everyone why Nancy Pelosi needs to be Speaker of the House. And so I think at this point, for me, whatever Speaker Pelosi decides to do, go with it. Because she is, the, to my mind, um, a brilliant strategist. She knows her caucus. She knows she knows her chamber. She knows the rules. She's steeped in history, and she has a reverence for the Constitution that is, to, for her, second only to the Bible. She's a, a, a practicing you know, a Catholic, very religious. And so when you put all that together, and she takes her job as a constitutional officer of the United States extremely seriously. So she's not coming at this um, uh, like an amateur. She's coming at this as a partisan, but also as a patriot. Because what she sees from her perspective is not just a degradation of the norms, but um, a degradation of the country and and who we are as a beacon around the world. And to the uh, to the point of timing, uh, going back to J. Mart's point, it's interesting to think about when the Democrats would most want that vote in the Senate to take place. Right. right? It seems like what you want to do is force the Cory Gardners and the uh, Susan Collins is to vote for the president and then take a hit, take that hit in the general election as a result. Right. So uh, the idea of getting this relatively sped up so that the vote happens before the Republican primaries and the filing dates seems like the smart one to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think she's going to squeeze the Republicans by having this well before the filing deadlines uh, in the House, certainly. And I think McConnell's eager to get it done in the Senate pretty quickly as well. Um, but I mean, I think we, we should talk for a minute about, obviously, we focused on Trump. I certainly did my remarks about what, how this is largely a referendum on him. But I think it's important to note, too, that um, if the Democrats, I think, the Democrats' message is going to be impacted next year in some way by who they nominate. And more to the point, what their stance is on health care. The Democrats won the House last year in part because of what their progressive base would say was a small ball message, right? Um, protecting people with pre existing conditions. That was like the gospel for them last year. Well, that's not good enough for, for a lot of their base. And they, and they want something that's more ambitious 
than just saying that, that sort of poll test of messaging. So is the Democratic nominee next year going to be openly campaigning for single payer and ending private health care in America? You're going to lose your health care. I think Cardinal said this, that the loser on health care is always the party that is taking something away. Right, right. If you're taking something or perceived to be taking something away in health care, in private, private health care in this case, then you're going to be seen as a loser. So that's an important cautionary note here yeah. that um, – I think a lot of this will depend on how they run on health care. The biggest question, I think, in the primary is, if Warren is the nominee, does she recalibrate on private health care? Yeah. Well, and that goes to the electability issue, right, yeah. in terms of what what is going to be an electable message against him. I was struck by a, a poll I saw the other day that said 33% of voters say that their vote in the general election will depend on who the Democrats nominate. Yeah. That was striking to me because – there can be moderate or conservative Democrats out there that would be willing to vote for a Biden, but not willing to vote for Elizabeth Warren and could vote for Trump instead. Yeah. So I, ju I think that's just a big cautionary uh, note for the Democrats out there and thinking who they nominate. And, so, and if you look at who won in the midterms, Lisa, it was mostly fairly moderate Democrats yeah. who won their mm -hmm. primaries and who became governors or won House seats. Um, a lot of uh, national security experience, a lot of women, um, but not a lot of sort of firebrands yeah. won last year, especially in statewide elections. Um, Kirsten Sinema in Arizona, certainly a very moderate Democrat, you, you know, Evers in Wisconsin, Whitmer, Michigan, fairly middle of the road Democrat. So I think that's what is causing a lot of folks in the kind of middle of the uh, Democratic Party to pull their hair out is we just had this great midterm election with all yeah. of these uh, you know, moderate, some would say boring candidates, and and now we're we're risking risking that. So let's um, let's get some questions from our smart room here. We have to answer. So something that Patrick said about having oh, hey, something that Patrick said about possibly having the impeachment vote strategically to put these Republicans on notice, right? They'll have to make a decision. But I want to flip that a little bit because I actually th want to hear what people think about whether the impeachment, taking a position on the impeachment for these Senate candidates, Democratic Senate candidates, will almost become the Kavanaugh, right? It's the Kavanaugh vote. I mean, we saw it in the polling, right? I mean, the, the fact is, is that you had these moderates who had the branding of moderates like, you know, Donnelly or McCaskill or Heidi Heidkamp, Heidkamp or, or Nelson, and you saw it immediately. They became Democrats. Their whole shtick was, again, we're moderates, we're in, you know, we work across party lines. Will the impeachment, not necessarily vote, but being for impeachment, will that be the scarlet D that be, makes them Democrats, the Kellys in Arizona, the Hickenloopers in Colorado, the Cal Cunninghams in, in North Carolina, the whoever in, in, in North Carolina, will it, will it work to the reverse where it just basically takes away their moderate, going to work with Republicans to get things done, don't, you know, it's, it's not about the big, the, 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 you know what I'm saying? Will it, be, will it become the Kavanaugh vote that basically brands them against what they're trying like to Like, if to you accomplish. know anything else about that candidate, you know how they voted on impeachment, right? Sort of like the Iraq war vote. Or they're not the, voting, uh, but they're taking a stance. Yeah. It didn't matter. I mean, we even saw, for example, you know, it, it, we saw numbers move immediately in places like Iowa mm -hmm. for the governor's race just because it, it, it moved. It polarized the election. Right. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Cal Cunningham is going to take a position on it. He's, you know, all the Democrats are going to be for impeachment, right? So does that become a, a dynamic where it puts them into – you know, just the Democratic branding rather than what they're trying to do. Hmm. Well, maybe, though, that's why you want to have this vote before Christmas, uh, because then actually by November 2020, we're fighting about something else. <laughs> and so the yeah. Democratic candidates haven't um, actually had to talk much about it, but the Republican incumbents have had to have actually taken a position on it. I mean, hard to say. There are lots of different scenarios. I mean, do we think that – do we think that the vote – so Manchin voted for Kavanaugh. Do we think? That, do we think that that vote would have appreciably that, that he would have lost that election had he voted against Kavanaugh? See, I'm. I just. I don't know. I. I'm so of the school of polarization these days that I think. Um, I think that those kind of votes matter less than ever. I really do. Well, don't because say that's a. Here's why. Not Heidi Heitkamp. Yeah. Here's yep. why. Here's why. 
Heidi Heidkamp, she says all, specifically know, that the Kavanaugh vote. And you know what? Phil Bredesen came out for Kavanaugh, and he still got yeah, right. smoked. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So well, that was South Dakota. <laughs> I think with the exception of, of with the exception of Manchin and John Tester, the Senate races last year reflected presidential preference because all of these elections in the Senate are polarized and are driven by by tribal red and blue instincts more than any other issues now. But the my exception point to that, is Kavanaugh accentuated the tribalism. And that's fair. Okay. And, and I think that if Heidkamp, McCaskill, and Donnelly would have voted for Kavanaugh, there's a good chance to lose. No. Well, the margins would be different, or maybe sure. one out of three win. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But my point oh, is, is that right. my point is, is that you immediately saw movement. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a cause and there was an effect, and they never came back from mm -hmm. from that vote. And again, I think it's because it basically made them into de Democrats, yeah. where their whole right. branding was, you know, they were you know moderate politicians who had their own identity and they worked across party lines, et cetera. And, yeah. and I, I, interviewed, I interviewed Heidi Heidkamp for my podcast, and I asked her about the Kavanaugh vote, and she said, without a doubt, that her vote against Kavanaugh, she knows, killed her campaign. Hmm. Absolutely killed her campaign. But Heidi was also closer to the precipice already, yeah. right? Manchin, you got to remember, Manchin's dynamic in the state of West Virginia as a former governor his relationships are much deeper with the voters, and he's already yes. fought back the challenge and strengthened his mm -hmm. muscles. I mean, Heidi Heitkamp has been in a fight for her life every day. Claire McCaskill was already, like, mm -hmm. dead in the water. so wounded. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say she was dead in the water, but mm -hmm. so wounded. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so I, what I'm saying is I think it'll be different for each of them. It exacerbated the polarization. Yeah. 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 Lost it by a little. Yes. But he lost it by a lot because at, the day, at that day, his, his race probably ended. Look, That's look, my so I, I think, think it'll depend on which. which so, I think it's fair to say that it, it exacerbated the polarization. But, Anzo, the polarization is the story. If you look at Sherrod Brown from 6 to 12 to 18 uh, in Ohio, and you just look at his numbers in that state. In Stabenow, mm -hmm. the exact mm -hmm. same deal from, from 2006, 12 to 18 in Stabenow. And you look at where they do better and where they do worse, it has nothing to do with Brett Kavanaugh. It's entirely an urban versus rural, educated versus non-educated story based on tr tr tribal voting in those states. I think it was an accelerant that you're not acknowledging. Uh, I just did. Well, no, you just didn't have But I'd also say in the 2020. The larger issue is polarization. Yeah, and I, I, I'm with Jay Mart on this one in terms of 2020, which is we know from history that in presidential election years, Senate campaigns look even more, Senate elections look even more like whether the state goes red or blue in the presidential race. So yes. um, I just think we're going to see the whole thing converging uh, by the time you get to Labor Day. Well, I agree with you that, though, that it's fair to say that it exacerbated the polarization. The point I'm making is the polarization is the story. Right. But my question is, you didn't really get to I'm ignoring the question. I think, question. <laughs> I think we're underestimating impeachment as a, a seller of this because, you know, listen, it's dominating everything. Yeah. And, you know, we only like to think of it in the con uh, contours of the presidential race. Yeah. And it's actually going to have dynamic down the ticket because in in these uh, center races so if you're mark kelly in arizona and your whole stick is i'm a former astronaut and navy veteran well all of a sudden you're the party of impeachment and you can't get to get that taint off you as easily yeah that's fair hey guys thanks uh it's been a great conversation um so this is more of an observation of the debates and i just wanted to get your guys thoughts on this um I, act, I think that the Democrats actually haven't done an, a, an effective enough job during the debates of contrasting themselves, particularly on health care, with the president. They are in a back and forth with each other, mm -hmm. and that, as they should. I mean, you know, they're always – you do have to, you know, define yourself against your competitors. But you can still do that and continue – and have a sentence which is – but let's not forget, we may all have slightly different ways we're going to get to health care as a right, but the Republican Party and uh, President Trump want to take away your health care, and they want to take away protections for people with pre-existing conditions. I've rarely heard any of the candidates up on that stage say that, and I think that's a... Senator it, Booker has. 
Well, but there's right. I mean, we can pull out one. Well, he's one out of twenty. Yeah. Right. My only yeah. point is, it's not a consistent <laughs> refrain right. that they should be saying. And con, you know, but there, and, and I, I don't actually hear it on a range of issues. Interestingly enough, the issue where I think they were most effective in terms of contrasting with the president was most recently on national security in the conversation about Syria that took place during the last debate, where they all basically were saying pretty much the same thing about how Trump was making us weaker and less safe. And that is typically an issue that Democrats aren't very comfortable litigating against Republicans. Healthcare is. They haven't been able to effective. I don't think effectively drawn that contrast with the Republican Party, even though we were so effective in 2018. So that's just an ob observation that I've noticed in, in the debates that it has become much more of a conversation about health, Medicare for all, and the dis and the disagreements that they have, and they haven't done an effective job of both making those distinctions between one another and making the distinguish yeah. and, and distinguishing themselves from from. From Trump, and that's a and that's a big tactical it's hard to, mistake. It, it's hard to do both. Yeah, you know, especially when the coverage is largely about the differences among the candidates in the primary. You know, but well, you, but on the debate stage, it isn't hard. I mean, yes. I yeah. Right. An well, and Cory Booker, who Jonathan said, is a great example of this. I mean, he's tried to lean into the guys we have more in common than not. Mm -hmm. Trump's the real enemy mm -hmm. here. And look where his numbers are. It hasn't moved his numbers. Yeah, you know? and, and the other problem, the other issue is um, the format of the debates. Yeah. <laughs> the CNN debate in particular, I thought, was problematic because it seemed to be more about getting them to fight each other right. than it was to actually have a conversation yeah. about the stances on the issues. Beto O'Rourke, who at that point I figured was a, a lightweight in the campaign when it came to policy, and he was asked a question about health care, and he was trying to explain his position, and he was getting up to speed and actually about to say what it was. And then he got cut off by the moderators who wanted to go to somebody yeah. else who had attacked Beto before he actually finished what he had to say. I think yeah. that it was in that debate when the candidates should have said, you know what, enough with – we all want people to have health care. Let's talk about the president who wants to, to take it away. And so when it comes to health care, they all have their, their differing ideas, and they want to talk about them, and they take the bait from us. Yeah. But when it comes to Syria, they're, they're all in agreement about what should happen, and that's why it's easier for them to sing from the same hymnal about that issue as opposed to, as opposed to health care. And I can tell you somebody that's produced a number of primary debates in my day, um, when, we're sit when, the when we're sitting around discussing questions and what's going to get asked, it's top of mind is how do we highlight the disagreements between the candidates that are up on the stage. Same thing goes in the control room. You know, it's like, move on. Are they saying something great and contrasting themselves with another candidate? They get all the time in the world. But <laughs> if they're not saying something like that, it's move on. Cut can off. I, so, can I just jump in here for of, a yes. second, too? Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> taking control of the panel here. Uh, not really. Um, look, I disagree with this point. The Democratic candidates have had enough time breaking through because they have 12 people, 10 people on stage. We have ample time to go after Donald Trump in this election. These debates are, to the extent you can, differentiate yourself where there are meaningful differences with other Democratic candidates. And I think if we're expecting, you know, if all of us get up there and just say, oh, we're all against Donald Trump, well, that's not going to be helpful to Democratic primary voters who are tuning in and watching these things in reasonable numbers to say, hey, are these distinctions without a difference? Or is there a meaningful difference between, say, Medicare for all and Medicare for all who want it and a public option? There are. Are there meaningful differences on issues around guns? There are. Are there meaningful differences around free college? I think that's what debates are for. And within the party, we should be having those debates so that the primary voters can make that decision. And I think it's a little bit pie in the sky to say, oh, we should all just be talking about Donald Trump. Yeah, he's hanging over this like a cloud, but he's going to be hanging over this like a cloud every day. And if you're only talking about him and not talking about yourself and, and legitimate contrast with other Democrats, you, we may as well not have the debates. Let me, let me ask a question coming at this slightly differently. So uh, buy into to Jonathan's point that the election is all about Trump, the general. Offer a second thesis, which is at some point, primary candidates have to lay the infrastructure for their general election message. You can't just wake up the day after the election and have a new message. You get held to a standard. Okay. Uh, third observation that um, some would argue that Hillary Clinton 
ran against you can't elect Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That that was one of our core messages. Was like really not that right. guy. So that didn't work out so good. And there are a whole lot of ingredients that went into her loss. And you could pick off. It was so close you could pick off any one of 12 different moments, including Russian interference, and change the dynamic of the relationship. So knowing that to some degree Hillary Clinton already ran on the. You would ne you should not elect him. You should elect me because he's Donald Trump, and that's awful. Yeah. What role, even though he does play it, what role should a campaign allow Donald Trump to, Trump to play in their campaign? Well, I think um, one uh, piece of this, I think that actually Elizabeth Warren has done very well, is the phrase that you remember this phrase when she said, um, "Donald Trump is corruption in the flesh." I thought that was terrific because what it does, it both combines her message, which is that this is a system that's rigged for the one percent, right. Plus a critique of him, right, which is corrupt Donald Trump and then also kind of essentially a, a side eye at his figure. <laughs> but uh, so the but I, I think it's that sort of pivot that a candidate needs to do, which is to marry what the, the kind of their message with a critique of the president and, and put those together. So we've spent a lot of time. Oh, go ahead. Lynn. Yeah, go ahead. You got a question? We're just interesting in being on a college campus. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable that in the panel on issues, no one's mentioned climate change. Because I will tell you, when you're with this demographic in our place, everything I else. Climate totally. change. Huh? I mentioned climate change. Did you? Yeah, you did in the opening, but no. Climate change. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, and then this gets back to attracting, <laughs> attracting the youth vote or turning yeah. them off. So, and I, I say it just as an observation that there's this disconnect where. For those of us who live with this demographic, if you have them here, they would say there's three main issues, climate change, climate change, yeah. climate right, change. Right, right, right. And here we are where none of us are saying it. So maybe it's not out there. And, and guns, maybe a second. Yeah. Actually, the high schoolers would say guns. And the college students, too. So it, I just raise it as an interesting disconnect mm -hmm. that um, and uh, how are we going to activate The Democratic people? nominee will certainly talk a good deal about climate change. Uh, next year yeah no and yeah. I think that they'll try to target Trump on that um, well and it's a motivator for young people to actually turn out and vote which they historically don't do anyway you know but I should also add as a guy who studies public opinion on climate change one could argue it's a loser issue yeah. for Democrats because when people vote on the nuts and bolts of climate change it does not go well Washington State, one of the bluest right. states in the country, turned down a carbon tax, right? right? So people say that this is an issue they care about, and that may be true. Do they want to pay for it? They do not. And so well, and that, the map, uh, too. Uh, and, right, and so Different. Trump's got a very good rebuttal. Whenever anyone says, any Democratic candidate says, I'm going to do something about climate change, he's going to say, how are you going to pay for it, and who's going to suffer because of it? Because you can't, you can't do anything about climate change without people suffering and people paying. So let's do... Let's do one last question um, for all of you to answer. We, we've given a lot of advice to our, oh, Joe, you got a question? We're gonna end up campaigning on a lot of corruption issues and the voters think it's bullshit, okay? They think it's process. They listen to all the stuff that's coming out and they say, well, he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, he's just trying to get after corruption because that's what they want to think and that's what right. Fox News is gonna tell them. Right. It's not gonna move voters. What you might be able to do is you might be able to make the case that the man believes he's above the law and he's cheating you. Now that people might get mad about, but it's all about how you frame the issue, right? So all this other stuff we're talking about kind of doesn't matter. So I agree with Joel. You got to talk about things right now among Democrats that matter to people who are going to make that decision about who's the Democratic nominee. And the Democratic nominee has plenty of time to drive message on the issues that matter to the country and against Donald Trump. So let me ask my one final question of all of you, which is um, we, we've given a lot of advice to Democratic candidates here today. Um, Donald Trump is the first president in the history of Gallup polling who has never had a single day with his approval rating above 50%. It is currently at about 44%. We've all talked a bit about why we think that may or may not matter. Um, if you were advising Donald Trump, what should Donald Trump be talking about? What issues should he be acting on to drive that number up? 
Good luck. I just stay off of Twitter. I don't know. I mean. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I would go back to sort of what I said earlier, which is um, I, the election that I actually think says the most about what this election might look like is 1976. OK, this is that's a year when the country is fed up with Republican right. corruption. Right. Nixon, you know, is impeached. People are pissed off at Ford, but the economy's pretty good, yeah. you know, and things are rolling along. Um, and so the it, and the Democrats, as everybody knows, eke out a very, very narrow victory. Um, what Trump needs to do is emphasize economic stuff. And then he needs to micro target and many uh, micro broadcast mm -hmm. the cultural stuff. Right. So and he's got a, a tremendous good channel to do that, which is all the Facebook and all the, Fox you know, the micro talking ads, Fox News. But to the general, you know, the general public, he needs to talk about the economy, the economy of the economy. And as all of us have been saying, the question is, <laughs> will he actually do that? Uh, and I so far, it doesn't look like and he's people, planning. Yeah, on can doing people it. go outside the prism and give him credit for it? Right? Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I have long believed that if the president had actually followed through on what he said, Said he was going to do on background checks, if he had actually followed through and signed the bill, a bill of love on DACA and the Dreamers, if he stopped doing what he's been trying to do on health care, if he had done any one of those things, he would be golden. His Those numbers would be higher. And he would put Democrats in a box. How do you run against a president who has fulfilled your priorities and priorities that he actually said on national television he thought should be done. And yet he's totally incapable of doing that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I did a piece a couple months ago with um, my colleague Maggie Haberman about um, a sort of a, a version of that, although more on economic populist um, issues than, than guns and uh, immigration. If Trump had actually governed as an economic populist the way he often ran, um, in, the, in 2016, if he would have demanded that McConnell brought to the floor a minimum wage increase, a prescription drug benefit that was pro-consumer and tough on industry, uh, and if he had told McConnell, we're going to do a big infrastructure bill, and it wasn't actually a joke, it actually happened, Trump would have been able to go to all these states around the country with big scissors and cut the ribbons. He would have loved it. Um, bridges, dams, roads, uh, new airports. I mean, he would have been in hog heaven as a builder doing that. And he could have really jammed Democrats who, because they would have actually had to vote with him on a lot of stuff. And given the tribalism, what would McConnell have done? He would have had to bring up those bills because the Trump voters would have wanted them. If Trump went to Colorado and said, is Corey with me or against me on, on infrastructure? And the crowd roars. We, we know how the votes would have gone. So he could have really triangulated going into his reelection, jammed Democrats, brought his own party along, um, no matter the influence of K Street folks like Ralph Collins, um, <laughs> because the voices of a pharma, the pharma lobbyists wouldn't have mattered. Trump is the party. And if Trump said, I am for a tough pro-consumer drug bill, then like all the lobbyists in the world wouldn't have been able to move that. But because he does not have the governing know-how, nor the attention span to pursue that kind of agenda, and because, and because he's surrounded by a Freedom Caucus chief of staff that, that, that is not interested in a populist agenda, he is where he is. Um, but it's a really fascinating to think of how that would have changed if there was folks around him, like Steve Bannon, for example, who would have pursued a more populist agenda, um, what he could have done to Democrats. Now, it's unrealistic because that's, a, that's not who he is, but he could have been a lot more formidable if they doing that kind of thing. All right. All right. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.